Good morning. Um, welcome to my channel. Um, my name is Gavin Boiter and I'm an author. Um, I will be reading you today a, a story of roughly 1,000 words, not exactly, um, but unusually it's based on five random words and the random words, as ever, are here. And this story is number 76. Wow. I'll probably continue till I get to 100. And then I'm not sure if I'll continue after that, but we'll see anyway. Um, so this story is called The Unwritten Page. I have a portrait of Alice in a Ziploc bag. I don't mean a photograph. I mean a rare self-portrait in watercolour. I asked her to send me a selfie and she spent her first day off in almost three weeks creating a beautiful miniature. The red squares in her paint box had run out. Alice substituted the juice of a local berry to capture the tonalities of her wavy red hair. Because she was nothing if not brutally honest, Alice's self-portrait includes sunken eyes and one pale veiny hand laid across her collarbone. There is evidence in that gaunt fragility that the cholera already has its hooks in her. I look at Alice's photograph before I strike camp each morning to strengthen me for the brutal wind and slanting snow that lashes the polar wilderness almost every day. Each evening I locate a low outcropping of refrozen ice to shelter behind and pitch my tent. As I'm struggling with my stiffening hands, I have to take off the outer mittens in order to locate the rods, I can see a zigzagging line of my footprints vanishing into the white void behind me. The following morning they have been erased. It's as if I was never there. The Arctic landscape is a text in a constant state of erasure, the page unwritten every morning. Alice worked for a relief agency in a remote Indian village in Madhya Pradesh, where 75% of the locals live in conditions of extreme poverty. The village has no electricity and only a handful of telephone wires linked to a constantly malfunctioning row of public phone boxes. Broadband and mobile phone coverage are a distant dream. Fresh water is scarce, sanitation almost non-existent. The village lies at the base of a river heavily polluted by an upstream sewage plant. Local people walk up to five miles each day to bring back clean water from dwindling mountain streams in plastic jugs loaded into wheelbarrows or balanced remarkably upon the heads of tiny yet sturdy women. Alice's organisation delivered the COVID-19 vaccine funded by a consortium of Western and Indian medical charities. The virus had already killed 12% of the population, which skewed heavily towards the over 70s. COVID-19 didn't kill Alice, who had been vaccinated and inoculated against a suite of possible viruses and bacterial infections. The local coroner informed her family, who in turn told me, that she died from extreme dehydration, brought upon by a sudden and vicious bout of cholera. That's right, cholera, in the 21st century. An ambulance rushed from the nearest town with a hospital, but it caught a flat tire on a rocky mountain road and lost half an hour waiting for any other vehicle to pass by with a spare tire. The ambulance did not have one. Eventually, the driver let down the other front tire and trundled slowly into town, ripping his good tire to shreds. Sadly, all his efforts were in vain. Alice suffered multiple organ failure before the IV drip could get enough electrolytes into her system. We met here in the Arctic Circle when I was photographing scientists for a coffee table book on polar exploration. Alice was on a placement in Svalbard in the UKL Arctic Research Station, treating frostbite, snow blindness, mild malnutrition and depression. I was setting off from there and Alice and I had a brief relationship of convenience which blossomed into a friendship and then a long distance love affair brutally cut short by her death last month. She'd always wanted to make it out to the North Pole but was considered too valuable a member of staff to be released to join in any of the annual expeditions. This is why, along with my camera, walking poles, snowshoes, goggles, multiple insulating layers, survival bag, flares, satellite phone and a £20 backpack, I'm carrying a small Ziploc bag of Alice's ashes. That's all I have left of her. A self-portrait in watercolour and 125 grams of carbon. I'm following the route mapped out for me by the Murmansk team who expressed concern that I insisted on going the whole way from the helicopter landing site on foot without a skidoo. The scientists I came with are taking cores from the ice pack at 78.5 degrees north 
to see if the ice is thinning due to global warming. It's the middle of April and the sun never sets. By the time I get to the North Pole, there will be no directions either. Everywhere from there is due south. There will most likely be no other life within sight. I'll be lucky if a bird crosses the sky all day. I'll sprinkle this small packet of Alice over the pole itself. Nobody except for her parents know I intend to do this. I'll call them on the satellite phone, smoke a cigarette at 20 degrees north, then trek back to base camp. It's a four day journey each way and although the air is relatively warm, sometimes even above zero, the wind is bitter and the blown snow resembles a low lying blizzard. My breath has crystallised into ice in my beard, which I occasionally brush away only to watch it build up again. I'm contributing my breath to the snowpack. Since Alice and I are both atheists, I know this ritual means nothing to her and is only of symbolic significance to me. Still, it seems essential. I have never faced down the possibility of mortality and I'm 44 years old. Alice didn't make it to 40. I can now see the pole ahead in the distance. The sun is shining directly into my eyes. I squint through my viewfinder and take yet another minimalist shot. The paddle-shaped sign is listing at a strange angle. I may actually have to prop it up with snowballs for the selfie I intend to send to Alice's parents. I can scarcely believe I'm here, just a quarter mile from the top of the world. I feel a deep swelling of something approaching joy and something like pain. I refocus my zoom lens to bring the marker, it is literally a pole, into focus. I'm walking to the very limit of our world. I wouldn't be here without the red-headed, multiply tattooed nurse I met just 18 months ago. I'm not going to take you with me, dear reader, on the final few hundred yards to the pole. That's for me and Alice alone. By the time I leave, my footsteps will have been erased again. The ice pack and my future will return to a state of unwritten purity. <sighs> so, uh, yes, I hope you enjoyed that. Quite a lot of research on that one. Um, I feel like it's quite cinematic and it might even be the beginning of something. Um, certainly it could be fleshed out to a longer story. But um, I haven't been to remote Indian villages or the Arctic Circle, so perhaps um, that's enough of a glimpse into those environments. Without, If I were to write something longer, it would require actual experience of going there. I don't feel it's right to write more than a sort of brief story set somewhere that you've never been. I may be wrong. Kafka wrote the book America, having never been to America. Anyway, um, hope you enjoyed that. Um, as ever, if you did, please share it. Um, sharing on your feed is one of the best ways of getting driving more people to my YouTube channel, as is subscribing and liking. Um, so you can do any of those things and that will be much appreciated. And who knows, perhaps this or other stories may be published and might get me a book deal. So that's good. Anyway, um, I'll see you again soon. Bye.